in golf? Question mark. That was Nick Saban's response before the season started to Jimbo, Fish, Jimbo Fisher's quote about saying Texas a and was going to beat Alabama's blank this upcoming season or at some point while Nick Saban was there. Well, most of us laughed at that statement by Jimbo Fisher and Nick Saban, including myself, because I thought it's not going to happen. But sure enough, Jimbo Fisher stayed true to his word, and Texas A&M beat Alabama on Saturday night in College Station, sending shockwaves through college football. What an amazing Saturday it was of college football games. Yes, obviously any team that lost their fan base is disappointing. There were a lot of tremendous games on Saturday and a lot of big upsets, a lot of games that came down to last-minute field goals. You couldn't have asked for a better Saturday. It may have been the best Saturday of college football so far this season. And again, looking at this slate last week, I was like, you know, I don't know this is going to be a very good weekend of games. I was kind of like, eh, wasn't super excited about it. In fact, I was more excited the week before and those games, a lot of those games ended up not being very entertaining. But this week was extremely entertaining, and it just sums up what college football is all about. You don't know what's going to happen on any given weekend. If you had told me a two-loss SEC team in Texas A&M that had almost lost on the road at Colorado would have beaten Nick Saban and Alabama, I would have laughed. If you had told me to come up with 100 different predictions of the Texas a and alabama game, I would have given you 100 different ways Alabama was going to win. But a and somehow pulled it off. a and probably will not play as good of a game as they played <laughs> against Alabama again this season. Zach Calzada played the game of his life. Texas a and stepped up. They made plays when they needed to. They responded when they needed to. And they kept their foot on the gas. What a, what a big game for this program for Jimbo Fisher, who AM fans, deservingly so, have been frustrated with Jimbo Fisher in this Aggie program so far this season after giving him the huge contract. But he beat Alabama, broke the streak of Alabama having 100 straight wins against unranked opponents, and the streak of Nick Saban having not lost to any one of his assistants. Also, did not think Jimbo Fisher would be the first assistant to break that streak, but he ends up being that. But besides just that game, and I'm going to hit on that game a little bit more later on, but there are also a couple other really good games in the SEC on Saturday, especially the 11 o'clock shootout game between Ole Miss and Arkansas. Wow, was that not entertaining. Ole Miss ends up pulling off 52-51. to Arkansas went for two to try to win the game. I completely, 100% agree with that call by Sam Pittman. That's typically now the call you see to go for two. If you're on the road, especially in that game where you're not stopping Ole Miss's offense at this point, I like the call to go for two there. Unfortunately, it did not work out for Arkansas in that moment, but it was the right call by Sam Pittman. Uh, Ole Miss defense uh, defended that two-point conversion play well. But great response by both teams. Coming off big losses, disappointing losses, they both came out, played hard, Played till the final seconds. These are two good teams. Again, I've addressed this, but these these are not bad teams. Uh, Georgia, of course, is on another level from everyone else right now in college football. I'll hit on that again a little bit later on. But these are are two pretty good teams. They, they weren't overrated just because they got blown out by Alabama and, and Georgia. They just had some. T- they had two tough weeks, and but they both responded well. Two teams again. SEC West is still wide open. It's going to be a little bit tough. For Ole Miss, considering their loss to Alabama, Arkansas with two losses also going to be a little bit tough. But if they can beat Alabama, they can make a run at things if they win out. So we'll see what happens there. And then Georgia at Auburn. Look, Auburn gave Georgia a game for about a quarter, but just wasn't able to really mount enough offense to stay in this game in the long run. Again, Georgia took care of business on the road at Jordan-Hare, which is not an easy place to play at. Stetson Bennett played the game of his life yet again against Auburn like he did, kind of like he did in the 2020 season. So props to him. I thought Auburn kind of did what they wanted to defensively with their game plan. They were able to slow down Georgia's run until later in the second half. They just eventually wore down, but they forced Stetson Bennett to beat them. But he can do that. Stetson Bennett has done a pretty dang good job as quarterback at Georgia. I know he's got weapons everywhere, and that helps a lot. But he's done a pretty good job, and he's done enough to make Me wonder, personally, do they stay with him when JT Daniels comes back? I kind of doubt it. I think they'll put JT Daniels there. 
McDaniel struggles at all, I think they'll be confident in putting Stetson Bennett back in that position. His mobility is better than JT Daniels. He doesn't quite have the arm strength, obviously, that Daniels has, but he's done a pretty uh, good job there uh, at quarterback for Georgia. Then what's going on at LSU? I think everybody wants to address this matter, including myself. Look, I didn't think LSU... They, they played hard Saturday, and I don't think there's a quit factor in it. They're playing hard. They're just not a very good football team uh, this year, and but that shouldn't be the case. There's too much talent there. They've recruited too well to not be very good. That's what they are. They're not a very good football team, and that's on Ed Orgeron. There, there's no ifs, ands, or buts about that. He's gone. It's just when, it's a matter of when. If you look at the history of the current AD, he typically waits till the end of season to fire head coaches, so I imagine that's what's going to happen here. And unless something uh, turns on a dime and LSU ends up winning out, don't see that happening. Or he could go ahead and speed up the firing process if he believes it's just so bad. But right now, again, the LSU players have not quit on Coach O. I don't believe. I thought they played hard. But they've got to be better. They, they tried. It looked like they tried a little bit more to run the ball against Kentucky. But they've abandoned it at this point. They're not having success doing it uh, on the offensive side of the ball. Defensive side of the ball, they're also struggling. Just the two coordinator hires, we talked about them back in the offseason on here. They were what they were. Uh, it was, you know, Coach O, I think, felt good about them. They were a little bit of a risk, though, with neither really having much experience as coordinators. So I, maybe that has backfired. But overall, there's issues there. I can't put a finger on exactly what it is, except that Coach O has to take the blame for this. And I believe he will be out of LSU by the end of the season, if not before. So let's look at these Week 7 matchups. And while we're discussing these Week 7 matchups, I do want to give more of a breakdown on what happened with Alabama against Texas A&M and some other keys moving forward for different teams. So we'll start out, though, with Auburn versus Arkansas, and I'll break down a little bit more of what Arkansas and Auburn both need to do here to win this game. 11 o'clock kickoff, Auburn traveling to Arkansas. Arkansas played the 11 a.m. kickoff last week. Maybe that'll give them an advantage. We'll see. What's Auburn's energy like coming off a, 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 a difficult defeat to a rival? You never want to get beat like that against a, against a rival. Are they energized? Are they playing hard? Are they, do they still believe they can have a chance to win the SEC West? Because, again, the message I'm preaching, if I'm Brian Harson, if I'm Sam Pittman even, to Arkansas, look, guys, let's go out, let's win out in the SEC West, and let's see what happens. Let's see if we can get to Atlanta. Because right now, the SEC West is still wide open. There's still a chance. I believe both teams will play hard. I believe both teams love their head coach, and I think they're going to get after it. But what is Auburn's response? What is Arkansas's response to this loss? Starting first with Auburn, what do they have to do better in order to beat Arkansas, in order to make a run at things here in the SEC West, to beat Arkansas, to beat Ole Miss, to beat A&M, to beat Mississippi State, and give themselves a chance to win the SEC West in the Iron Bowl? Well, they have got to figure out how to get the running game back going. Look, I understand you're playing against the best defensive line and arguably the best uh, defense in the last five years in college football in Georgia on Saturday. I understand not being able to run the football. But they didn't run the football against LSU either, and that's kind of inexcusable. Uh, as you saw with Kentucky just kind of running it down LSU's throat, Auburn's got to figure out a way. You have two, your, your best position group on your team is the running backs, and, you're, and you cannot even get to near 100 yards rushing with either of those guys. They've got to get Jarquez Hunter, Tank Bigsby involved more in this running game. Look, I know people are fussing about the amount of touches Tank Bigsby has gotten. I really just believe that Auburn is kind of, I don't think they're intentionally doing that as much as they just didn't feel like they could run on Georgia last week. But LSU understood. But you also got to quit falling behind. That's another reason. When you fall behind as much as Auburn did, fell behind 13 points against LSU, uh, fell behind multiple scores against Georgia, it forces you a little bit to abandon the run as well. So the important thing is establishing it early, getting those touches to Tank, getting those touches to Jarquez, because right now the best rushing offense has come from Bo Nix. And with that being said, let me address Bo Nix again here. Bo Nix was not the reason uh, Georgia dominated Auburn on Saturday. In fact, Bo Nix was on the only reason Auburn was able to score any points, in my opinion. Look, Bo Nix has been a much better quarterback since the Georgia State game. 
Has he been perfect? Absolutely not. Is there things he still needs to get better at? Absolutely. He needs to be more consistent with his pocket. He's got to see the field a little bit better. At times in the Georgia game, he did run out of the pocket too soon. But again, I think he was probably a little bit nervous about that pass rush getting home to him. So yes, he's got things to improve on. But if you look, his completion rate in that Georgia game was a little over 50%. Auburn had anywhere from 7 to I've seen up to 15 or so drops. Anywhere in that range of passes that should have been caught anyways by receivers. Pro Football Focus changed, did some whatever metrics they do and said, well, if those balls have been caught, Bo Nix completion percentage would have been around 88%. So I do not believe the Georgia game was on him. I do not believe he's the issue. Auburn's got to be more consistent at the receiver position. Look, I know the whole argument, Auburn's got to recruit better. And yes, they do. If they want to be able to compete each and every year with Alabama and Georgia and have a chance to beat them, yes, they've got to recruit better. But I don't care what type of receiver you are, whether you're an unranked receiver or a five-star, there's no excuse for dropping the football. That's something that you can do no matter how talented you are. You can catch the easy passes. And that's what Auburn has to have from their receivers. They don't have to make the spectacular catches. But they've got to be able to make the easy ones. So they've got to fix that moving forward as well. So that's going to be big for Auburn being more consistent at the receiver position. We know the history there. They already fired the wide receiver coach in Cornelius Williams. But that position has got to improve. And up front, again, they've got to be able to establish the run a little bit more. The offensive line, we all know what it is. It's not very good. But if they can just be average, with the running backs they've got and Tank Bixby and Jarquez Hunter, they can have success running the football. They've got to be able to do that. Now for Arkansas, keep doing what you're doing. Uh, continue to get KJ Jefferson involved in the running game. He's a hard guy to bring down. Ken O'Brien's has done an excellent job. He's a great offense coordinator. Running the ball, play action off of that. They've had a lot of success. I believe Arkansas can have success exposing this Auburn secondary, which has struggled. Going into the season, I thought Auburn may have the best secondary in the SEC. And in fact, they've had one of the worst in the SEC, which is very surprising to me. So can Arkansas exploit that this week with their play action pass? Can they take advantage of some soft zone that Derrick Mason likes to run, hit some underneath? And then if Auburn goes to a man, hitting him over the top, we saw George able to do that. It's some man-to-man -man coverage on the outside. Look for Arkansas to do that. Here's the deal. Auburn's been very good against the run, so Arkansas has to be able to establish that early in order to be able to hit play action off that. If they can't, if Auburn forces them to become more one-dimensional throwing the football, it could be, it could create issues, and that's why I think it's important to get K.J. Jefferson involved in the run. Make Auburn have to defend him as well, and that could open up the running game more if, if Arkansas allows Jefferson to use his legs. I think that'll be very important for the Razorbacks. Defensively, make Auburn be one-dimensional. That'll be a key. Force, force Bo Nix to beat you. Make him stay in the pocket, though. I thought Georgia did a good job of that. Don't allow him to stem plays, get outside the pocket, and run. Force him to stay in the pocket and make throws. At the end of the day, this game is a pick -em, in my opinion. I don't know who's going to pull it out. It, it really is a tough call. How, how do both teams respond? Arkansas coming off back-to-back -back losses. I think you have to feel pretty good about their chances considering the storyline of last year um, but I'm really I, I really don't have a great feel for this one this week Alabama at Mississippi State look Alabama's gonna respond well I think they're gonna destroy Mississippi State this weekend but they're on the road again so let's look at the issues Alabama has had this season both of their games that ended up being close, and Alabama, of course, lost one, were to Florida, Texas A&M, both on the road. The fact of the matter is, this team's not the same team that they, at home as they are on the road, and that has to change. Championship teams know how to go on the road and how to, and they don't let external environments affect the way they play. Alabama had that issue. They've got some young guys. They do. And also, the games that they've lost, another common denominator, teams have been able to run the football on them. That Texas A&M offensive line is not very good. That Florida offensive line, okay. Both teams had success running the football on Alabama. They adjusted very, very well in the second half. If you look at almost the whole entire second half, A&M was held without a touchdown until uh, one of the, the final drives of the game in the second half. Uh, give Alabama's defense credit for adjusting. They ended up stopping the run. 
they did a very good job. They've got to come out and do that for four quarters, though. They can't give up that many points in the first half and then adjust the stopping run in the second half and put them too far behind. Offensively, look, they had to talk about Auburn with their drops. Alabama had way too many drops as well. Also, Bryce Young, yes, made some, uh, made some bad throws, but overall, I thought he was fine. I thought he played well enough to win. Alabama's offensive line, I'm not sure what was going on with their pass protection. I don't know if it was miscommunication or if they were in the, just in the wrong protection to deal with A&M's blitz. Mike Elko set up an overload blitz, and Alabama simply didn't. They needed probably to slide over to get the numbers there in that protection. Instead, they looked to be more on big on big, didn't slide. It left multiple guys unblocked on numerous occasions and created trouble uh, allow sacks to happen, force Bryce Young to either get rid of the ball too soon. He created issues, and they really never adjusted well to it. One time, one play, I do remember they did get a touchdown, I believe, to Jamison Williams, where they did make A&M pay for that blitz. But they've got to be better either with their adjusting their pass protection to that or communicating or just not getting beat. I, I really don't know exactly whose fault it was. If there was somebody else supposed to pick up that blitz like the running back or if the offensive line just didn't slide or they just got beat. But whatever happened there with the pass protection, Alabama has to be better going forward in that. In fact, the matter is you can't be sloppy on the road. You can't turn the ball over twice. you got to convert, especially in the red zone, fourth and goal. Bryce Young threw the interception. Look, that was a great play by the Texas A&M defender. But at the end of the day, you cannot turn the ball over especially in the red zone, and they didn't make A&M pay when A&M turned the ball over. you got to get points off turnovers. Overall, it was just a sloppy game from Alabama, arguably the sloppiest I've seen them play in a while. They're going to be fine, they, but they've got to figure out how to play better on the road, how to not play sloppy, and again, how to come out ready to play. They cannot get gashed in the running game. Look, you're not going to have to worry about that this weekend against Mississippi State. They're obviously going to be air raid. But going forward, SEC stopping the run is so crucial to defenses and defensive having success going forward. Now, Florida at LSU. How does LSU respond at home? A win versus Florida can maybe tw uh, turn the fate for Ed Orgeron a little bit. Can Florida take care of business on the road in Baton Rouge? It's an 11 o'clock kickoff. But I'm sure it'll still be loud there in Tiger Stadium. Florida, 142-0 against Vanderbilt. Really not really challenged. Did not watch that game at all, if I'm being honest with you. How do they play this week at LSU? Losing to LSU last year in what was a very devastating loss for them in what was just a weird night last year against LSU. I believe they'll get the win. I think they're going to play well. The line's only at about 10. I think Florida covers in this game. Texas A&M at Missouri. This is the textbook definition of a trap game. The Aggies are coming off the biggest moment of their season, the biggest moment for a lot of these players' careers. Zach Calzada had the game of his life, as I mentioned earlier. Now they've got to travel to Missouri for 11 a.m. kickoff. How do they respond? Where is their energy level at? Are they still hungover from the Alabama game. That's the question mark. That's what makes this game so dangerous. I think they'll probably pull it out, but I think it's going to be close. Look, a and excuse me, Missouri's really struggling this year. I Honestly, I've been disappointed after what was a better than expected season from Missouri last year defensively. They've been horrible. They've been so bad defensively. Eli Drinkwitz fired their defensive line coach. And I really did expect more out of Missouri. It's, it's going to be a weird environment. Missouri's crowds aren't the best, so it'll, it'll be a more of a quiet type of game. Uh, I think it's just going to be a weird feeling for A&M coming off um, last week in the environment they played in at home. I think A&M pulls it out. It's going to be a close one, though. Probably a sloppy type of game. Maybe even low scoring for, for these two teams, especially with Missouri, who's used to scoring a lot of points. But I think in the end, A&M's defense will bail, them out, bail out the offense a little bit in this game, and A&M will pull it out in a close one on the road here. Vanderbilt at South Carolina, the matchup we've all been waiting for. Really, really am intrigued to, to see how this game goes this, this weekend. Look, we know Clark Lee, Shane Beamer both know it's a rebuilding project. It's going to take time 
to get these programs back where they want them. Both teams are very, very bad. South Carolina, though, is not near as bad as Vanderbilt, in my opinion. They're at home. They'll win this game. Clark Lee has got to find stuff to keep his players encouraged, though, to keep them playing hard. Look, he's taking this old-school approach to, to, to Vanderbilt. I think he'll have success there. But again, both teams, big-time rebuilds going on there. But I like South Carolina in this game. But I am intrigued to see can Vanderbilt compete with somebody like South Carolina. That's to be determined. Now, Ole Miss at Tennessee. Man, this is going to be a fun one Saturday night. Lane, there's a couple big storylines. First, Lane Kiffin returns to Tennessee. That's obviously a big storyline. I know he's excited about that. But the other big storyline is the two high-powered offenses of Tennessee and Ole Miss going at each other. Could this be another game like Arkansas Ole Miss as a complete shootout? I believe it probably will be. It looks as if Tennessee has found their rhythm a little bit. This is what Tennessee fans wanted offensively when they hired Josh Heupel. They wanted to see an electric offense. They've gotten it, but it's been against lesser opponents. The Ole Miss defense still isn't good. Tennessee should be able to put points up on the board. They found some success now with Hendon Hooker at quarterback. I really want to see can Ole Miss put up the same amount of points against Ole Miss that they have in their previous two games. I believe they can. In the end, though, I think Ole Miss defense comes up with a few stops that Tennessee's defense just can't at the moment because uh, this Tennessee defense right now is still pretty, pretty, pretty bad. I believe Ole Miss will outscore them, but I think it's going to be an electric environment at Neyland uh, Stadium this weekend, Saturday night, under the lights. I'm looking forward to it. And to close, the 2.30 game on CBS, Kentucky at Georgia between the two undefeated teams left in the SEC. If you had to... If you had told me what two teams in the SEC would be left undefeated week seven of the season, I promise you I would not have included Kentucky in that. But they're 6-0. They're playing against Georgia in Athens. The question here is, can Kentucky compete with Georgia? That's the question every week everyone's asking. Just can, can my team compete with them? Auburn did for a quarter, couldn't continue it. Can Kentucky do it for longer? I really don't think so. I think Kentucky's a good team. I do. But this Georgia defense is so good. Kentucky's defense is pretty good. It can give Georgia some uh, some issues, I think. But I just really don't see Kentucky's offense being able to really have any success. They've got to get Chris Rodriguez going on the ground. Again, that's going to be the key. Finding a way to get some kind of rushing attack against this Georgia defense. It's not going to be easy. But if you want to have some success against Georgia, you got to find a way whether that's through your scheme, some way have to figure out how to get that running game going. If they can do that, they stand a chance to compete. But in the end, I think Georgia covers the lines about 24. I, I think Georgia will end up winning a similar in a similar style like they did against uh, Auburn this past weekend. Well, that's a wrap of this week's episode. Thank you for joining. I know it's been a while. Uh, a lot of things going on. Unfortunately, I haven't been able to record as much as I'd like to, but it's super excited I was able to today. So thank you all for tuning in. Hope you enjoyed this week's slate of games.